I'd like to thank all the committees of Latin, um, Latinx and AI for inviting me for this uh, brilliant workshop. It's, really, uh, it's been a really nice experience. Uh, um, not only uh, watching the, the talks of today, those were really nice, but also the works that were presented. Today I'm going to talk about speech processing, and I'm interested in particular uh, and do it for languages under low data regimes. Uh, but before, I'd just like to, uh, for you to, to know a bit, little bit of where I came from, Universidade de São Paulo, USP, which is the, most, the, the main university in Brazil right now. Uh, I'm located at the Institute, Institute of Mathematical and Computational Sciences in the city of São Carlos which is not in the city of Sao Paulo, which is really good because Sao Paulo is kind of like crowded place um, and Sao Carlos is more relaxed place and to live. Um, well, and there's also my team uh, from Universidade de Sao Paulo mainly, but also from Federal University of, Technological University of Paraná. And two companies, Koki, which is a startup based in, in Germany, that is dedicated specifically to speech processing and also defined AI, as well as others. In terms of speech processing, we have two main tasks. The first one is the automatic speech recognition, in which we have a speech, and um, as of uh, we were seeing um, earlier today, people that were speaking have their, their, their speech translated or transcribed automatically. Then, uh, after um, the methods that were published using deep learning techniques, this field allowed for what we have today, which is uh, personal devices such as uh, Alexa and others that are able to, to automatically recognize what you're saying and, uh, and, and then, like, and this is done, like, personalized for, for every person. And this was made possible by th those deep learning models, and I'm going to highlight a few of them, uh, which uh, were deep speech and deep speech 2 that used RNNs. And later, the first work that introduced uh, unlabeled data for these tasks was Wave2Vec. And most of those models were, uh, were developed by companies instead of universities. So DeepSpeech and DeepSpeech2 by Baidu, Wave2Vec, Facebook, and Conformer, which uh, combined convolutional neural networks with transformers by Google. And later, data more, more recently, uh, Data2Vec, which uses self-supervision in order to uh, gather data from different sources or different domains, not only speech, but also text and, and, and images as well, which is kind of the trend in the moment, 2022 and on. We also have the task of speech synthesis or text-to-speech, which grabs the text and then synthesizes the speech. The problem here is that uh, when you think about it, you have a text and, and you have a language to, for it to speak, but who is speaking? Like, wh which voice are you going to hear? Um, and then usually what we have then is, were in the past, were mostly speech synthesis models that were trained for a single person. So it's a, just one speaker and it's specialized in creating voice of a specific pe person. There were many models in the uh, last five or six years. Uh, most important models are, were Tacotron uh, that were developed at Google that used RNNs again, and it was a time that it, uh, often uh, recurrent units were used in this type of task. And, and then later, 
um, at Microsoft, they, they developed it to, uh, because one of the problems at the time, that inference time was not that good. And then at Microsoft, they, they developed a teacher-student model uh, in that the teacher was a much larger model, but the student was small, uh, smaller so that it allowed for faster inference, and, and that is the fast speech uh, approach. Later, what changed basically was the use of flow-based decoders. Such flow-based decoders changed because it allowed um, even faster inference time without the need of a teacher-student approach. And the WITS, WITS approach, which was the first end-to-end -end approach, in the sense that in the um, previous work, what uh, they usually do was to train separately an encoder-decoder for the text and the speaker embedding, and separately we have uh, a, a vocoder, which was a generator for the speech itself. So they were, those were trained independently, and uh, the EATS and, and VITS model, they introduced a way of doing it end-to-end. Um, -end. So you just plug all the parts and you have a single loss function or a combination of loss functions that uh, enable you to train the model. And that's why uh, one of the works I'm presenting here is uh, heavily based on VITS. There's yet another problem here. Imagine that you have trained your model to synthesize speech, and it has seen, it has seen many multiple uh, speakers, but you want you uh, you want it to uh, output speech of your voice, and it was not it was not trained with your voice. In this case, uh, you don't have a paired association between text and the speech, because in training time we do have to have a uh, paired speech and text. So imagine now we don't have this association anymore, and I just have a sample of someone, vo uh, someone voice, like a speech of a few seconds, but without the text to pair with. And we still want to generate speech. So this is called zero-shot text-to-speech. Zero-shot text-to-speech is more recent. We have uh, work, uh, works dating from 2018. Of course, there were a few attempts before, uh, but this is more like deep learning-related methods. And I would li like to highlight two of them. Kazanov, which was my PhD, former PhD student, which just graduated like a few weeks ago. The problem with uh, these types of um, methods is the resource and performance gap, and this motivates our work. In English, we have lots of data sets, lots of computational power, lots of models that were already trained or pre-trained. Uh, there are other languages in which we have um, not comparable but sufficient data to learn from, such as Mandarin and other uh, languages, few languages, and the remaining languages for which we have very few or nothing at all. In, just for you to have a reference, for zero-shot learning, we have the English data set, the benchmark has 98 speakers. The MAI Labs is a French data set with only five speakers. In, in Portuguese, we just have a data set with one speaker. And there uh, motivate us, uh, motivated us to create the your TTS, which is a multilingual model that takes advantage of the high speaker count of English in order to um, use that to learn for languages with less data. And this system is able to do many things, which is really uh, interesting and, and really cool. The first one is to generate uh, uh, some voice from a specific speaker, so this is not a specific uh, model that is specific for a, a speaker. It can be trained with different speakers. And as well as you, uh, as long as you pass the speaker ID, it will generate speech from this specific person. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air that act as a prism and form a rainbow. 
When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. So even if we, there are different gender and different uh, pitch and such, it's able to, uh, to, to decode it in a way. We can also have a, ling a system that is multilingual, which means we, instead of just having a speaker ID, we also have the language ID. And for a specific person, it generates when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. Lorsque la lumière du soleil frappe les gouttes de pluie dans l'air, celles-ci agissent comme un prisme et forment un arc-en-ciel. In this case, uh, it's not translation, right? So I have to type the correct uh, text in French, but it does, uh, it is able to speak in French like a native would do. And when it comes to zero-shot learning, as I said, we don't have the text to pair with, so we have a person that we're not seeing during training. For example, this is Julian. He's a native French speaker, one of the co-authors of our paper. And he's the re he's, this is the reference of him talking. Oops, sorry. Yeah. La liste des réglementations européennes en la matière est longue. He speaks very fast. <laughs> Uh, and here is a zero-shot version. That means we just passed the, uh, his refer reference to the model, and now the model is able to talk as him. Lorsque la lumière du soleil frappe les gouttes de pluie dans l'air, celles-ci agissent comme un prisme et forment un arc-en-ciel. La liste des réglementations européennes en la matière est longue. Looks really uh, nice, right? And we also can do cross-lingual zero-shot. That means I can get Julian's voice, pass it the uh, language, a different language ID that is not French, and have him talk in English. The list of European regulation in that domain is long. The list of European regulation in that domain is long. La liste des réglementations européennes en la matière est longue. And uh, because zero shot sometimes it's not very, uh, for Julian it worked really well, but not for many people. Uh, especially when we have, in, in, in Portuguese, for example, I'm going to show you later the, the, the results, because we just have one uh, speaker in the tra training time, and so zero shot sometimes doesn't work very well. Even in, in English, here we have Chris uh, Shobi, which is another co-author, and he's a native English speaker, so we could test with this as well. So this is the uh, reference from Chris. To make a revolution every day, is the nature of the sun. And this was generated using zero shot for Chris' voice. I'm very glad to introduce the text-to-speech system that we made. But if you fine-tune it with just 60 seconds of Chris' voice. I'm very glad to introduce the text-to-speech system that we made. I'm very glad to introduce the text to speech system that we I'm made. Very glad to introduce the text to so speech you can see that, that fine tuning really helped and it doesn't require much. Just 60 seconds of his voice paired with the text. And finally, we can do voice conversion, which is we have a reference voice. This comes from the subject 228. And so I want the model to speak using this voice. And I have a driving audio, A, and then I can convert the audio from the subject 226 into 228. Please call Stella. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. So I can talk something and then uh, speak something and then uh, get, uh, I don't know, a friend's voice <laughs> and translate, convert my voice into my friends. So now let's get to the, uh, you have seen what it does and now let's see how it does. First inference, uh, the inference time, we, um, because I think it's easier to start as you, as, you, as you probably have noticed, I start from the end, like from the results, and then we go through the details. So we, we start from the inference. This is, um, we have multiple parts. 
first, what we, what it has as input is text and a language ID. And the language ID is concatenated to every char embedding that allows for code switching. For example, if you have a sentence in English that has some words that were pronounced in other languages, I can do code switching easier. Uh, for example, I have a feeling of déjà vu. Uh, déjà vu is a word that's pronounced in, in French, although the, the, the sentence was in English. Um, also, then after this concatenation, this, co this embedding, that's a text embedding, goes into a transformer encoder, and it also goes to a stochastic duration predictor. This is really important for the naturalness of the speech, because some phonemes are pronounced quickly and some are longer, and sometimes we do vary them. And for this to work in a more natural way, uh, we do have to have a, set, uh, a component that's uh, a predictor of the, of the duration. Uh, and in the side here, as let me see if it, no, it doesn't appear. So here in the right bottom side, we have a speaker encoder. The speaker encoder uh, gives us the audio reference that were our talking, I was talking about. So this audio reference also goes into the duration predictor because I have to, what I wanted to do is to pair parts of the phonemes with the actual audio. And I would say like this is one of the most difficult parts of the model, like most, most difficult, uh, still the, the uh, open work, let's say. Everything goes into a duration regulator. We are going to see, this is in inference time. Actually, what it does is to uh, align the, uh, text with voice. Because here what I, what I have is just the reference of the speaker. This is not the actual speech from which it trains. It just learns how to uh, predict the duration and also uh, conditions the decoder and the vocoder to the voice. I will, I will explain better like what the duration makes in training time. The flow decoder is responsible uh, to get the latent variable that comes from the text and outputs the representation that goes into the generator, which we call the vocoder, that then uh, outputs the actual speech. In training time, we have a component that was not in inference time, which is the posterior encoder. Basically, it's a lot of WaveNet residual blocks. This uh, is the most, most important part of the, of the training process because it's, uh, it really learns the latent variable that will serve both to the flow decoder to align phonemes and for the vocoder to generate the speech. And this was the, like the, um, let's say the breakthrough that, that we, we um, got, got from the Witz model that were really clever. Um, and that this, this made it possible for us to adjust with the stochastic duration predictor, the embedding layers and so on that was our contribution. So the, we, we have an audio reference, so for, for, uh, we have paired text and speech. With that, we, we do not have the ground truth, right? So the spectrogram is the, the input representation for the speech that we want to uh, reproduce. The posterior encoder then learns how to transform it in a latent variable that at the same time can be used to synthesize and to align with the text. So in the middle here, we have the latent uh, ZP, which comes from the flow decoder, and the pseudophonemes. It, they are pseudophonemes because they are representation of phonemes. They are not directly, not text, uh, nor speech, still. So uh, those pseudophonemes, they are aligned in the alignment module. This is... Uh, an algorithm called mono, uh, monotonic alignment search, MAS, 
that was proposed in the GLOW TTS model. As of the loss functions, we have, a, we have first here in yellow, this is the only part that's trained separately in our model. This is the, what generates the speaker embedding. So before anything, before the model starts to be trained with, uh, with uh, actual speech paired with the text, we have to have a representation for the speakers. And uh, the state of the art way to do that is to use a softmax and a prototype angular loss function. Softmax is a classification loss. And the prototype angular is a kind of triplet loss but using uh, ang uh, angles or cosines instead of uh, metric uh, or uh, Euclidean distance. And we use the Vox Lab data set, which is a, a data set with lots of uh, examples and different per people, like celebrities. So it's, it's, it's um, responsible for being able to separate different people so different tones of voice, different pitch. So this is enough for us to start training with. And the TTS model uses a speaker consistency loss. So this is, uh, now it becomes clear about why the speaker encoder is so important, because the speaker consistency loss is computed on the speaker embedding. Using the speaker embedding between, so the, the speaker embedding of the ground truth and the speaker embedding of the generated audio embeddings. And now um, you have heard other people talking through your TTS, and now you're going to, s to hear me talking <laughs> in different languages. So first in Portuguese, uh, and those are the, the sentences I, I used as input for the model. First, you're going to hear the zero-shot version. That means the, mo the model never heard me speaking, just l l heard me speaking, but not with the text paired. And just in Portuguese, right? We, the, my reference audio was in Portuguese. O modelo me ouviu falando apenas em português, mas com words, sei falar também inglês e francês. And this is very interesting. I don't know if there is any Brazilian people. Yeah. Uh, do you recognize this accent? <laughs> o modelo me ouviu falando apenas em português, mas com words, sei falar também inglês e francês. It's a typical like accent from the uh, countryside of Brazil, especially Minas Gerais and São Paulo, and also Paraná. Uh, because this data set, the data training data set, was the, the person, the, the single speaker, had this strong accent. And now with fine tuning. O modelo me ouviu falando apenas em português, mas com yurte te sei falar também inglês e francês. Now it sounds more like me. <laughs> now in English, zero shot. The model will be speaking only Portuguese. But with yours, I can also speak English and French. The model had me speaking only in Portuguese. But with yours, I can also speak English, French. And I'll, I'll go through the, all the, the remaining to not bore you. The model m'a entendu parler uniquement en portugais. Mais avec yours, je peux aussi parler en anglais et en français. The model m'a entendu parler uniquement en portugais. Mais avec yours, je peux aussi parler en anglais et français. That's really cool, uh, but we can do more things with it. Uh, just the, the work I just presented now uh, was published, coincidentally, it was published at ICML um, in this, this, uh, this year, and it's going to be presented on Wednesday. And we also have another work that tries to use such model in order to improve automatic speech recognition. So the idea is to uh, decrease the gap of performance due to, uh, to, to not having sufficient large data sets to train with. So for, you, for us to have a reference of what I'm talking about with a single speaker using the TTS data set, a baseline 
would have an error rate, uh, a word error rate of 63% in Portuguese. That means it gets 63% of the words wrong, which basically makes the model unuse unuseful. And we also tested in another language, Russian. Uh, it, it, ha it almost like uh, gets everything wrong, like 74%. But, okay, this is our baseline. We're using just one speaker. What if we have more speakers? So we use the common voice data set, which is a, a um, data set that is organized by Mozilla Foundation in order to um, improve these this, this problems of um, low regime data sets, plus our TTS data set. Then it drops uh, to 20% in Portuguese and 24% in Russian, which is quite good. But for this, we, we should have multiple uh, speakers. So this is the, is the huge gap, for example, from single speaker to multiple speakers. So what we did was use your TTS in order to generate other, other data, new data, just synthetic data. And then from, uh, you, from using one speaker plus generated voices, both we using uh, zero shot TTS and voice conversion, we, we could decrease 30% of the error, uh, word error rate in Portuguese and 38% of word error rate in Russian, which is really impressive um, if you think that the model uh, has seen only one person speaking in this language specifically. Of course, there are many limitations of using few, um, few speakers. As you have probably have noticed with my voice, uh, there is uh, accent, there is accent suppressing that we, we could try to deal with. So if, if there is only one speaker and the person has a strong accent, we, uh, the model will carry this accent to generated voice. It also may have monotonic tones for long sentences. It, this happens with my voice in, 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 in the, the examples that I was just showing you. Um, because I, I generated more like long sentences. And usually what I did when I, I offered a, a uh, reference audio of myself was to read a text. And usually when we read, we do it more like in a flat way uh, and don't use much expression. And we realized that if we give the model more expressive speech, it helps also in, uh, in this kind of scenario. And also we have a natural speeds for some speakers or some language combinations because it doesn't learn very well some types of phonemes. Uh, for instance, when I was talking your TTS, it doesn't pronounce it because I never uh, speak like uh, uh, anything like uh, separate uh, characters, separate, separate letters or such. And also, we, we want to reduce audio artifacts. In many of those data sets, there are artifacts, noise from, from not being recorded in a studio or outside noise. Uh, and sometimes it, the model carries those noise and artifacts to the generated voice. And it would be interesting to reduce that. Finally, opportunities that we see that are really interesting to capture different accents and particularities of our, our uh, languages. Because, of course, there is Portuguese, but there is Portuguese um, from Europe. There is Portuguese from Brazil. That's not only one. Like, there are many different ways of speaking. And in Spanish, uh, I'm now working with people from Latin America, and it's quite interesting to see uh, it's same same language, but very different ways uh, to talk, uh, expressions, ways of, of, of using the same language. Then for me, that's really beautiful. Like it captures the localities, the regional, the regional aspects. And uh, to preserve this would be really interesting. So uh, we want to learn from few speakers or very low resource languages. For example, indigenous languages, dialects, that would be really nice. Uh, there we, we now have a project back in, in Brazil to do that. Like we want to, um, to in, in a way, know uh, or, or get to, to know some person 
that speaks a, a indigenous languages. For, uh, for now, we we are focused on in Brazil. For this language not to be lost, right? So we want to know many of those languages don't, doesn't have anything written. So it's just an oral uh, culture, oral uh, memories, and um, that would be really nice to to preserve. And also learn speech of people that may have lose their their voices. So, uh, for example, if you have a pathology, and you know that eventually you're going to not be able to speak, wouldn't be interesting to have a model that is able to synthesize the way you talk, so then you can express yourself as yourself, even though you cannot do it uh, biologically or organically anymore. There are uh, many opportunities. So you can use your TTS. Uh, our, our, one of the co-authors uh, have Koki. Uh, it has a client. It's just pip install TTS, and there you go. Um, and also those two references. The first is, like I said, published in ICML. And the second one is just submitted. And that's it. Thanks very much for the patience, and that's it. Thank you, Moazir. Uh, maybe we have questions for Moazir. Uh. Um, could you go to the possibilities slides, please? Sorry? Could you go to the possibilities slides, please? Yeah. Yeah. I, I find one missing. Like, I could copy your voice and act as, uh, as if I were yourself. Now I see in the next slide that is I something is something that I can access and do pip install TTS. So like yeah. I'm now minutes from copying your voice and replacing yourself. Do you have any guardrails, any anything to prevent that, or at least to identify when someone is is doing something like that? Um, for privacy concerns, you mean, or not? Or just malicious intents? Okay. Uh, in this uh, here, what is usually done is yeah, the what is available are the are the embeddings and not the actual voices. So we won't be able to generate like a voice. Uh, you won't be able to know which like of the combinations would be the the, the one that would generate someone's voice. Like you have to like do it like to try and error different uh, different speaker embeddings until you find or the different speaker ID sorry yeah, until you find the one that's from that person so usually the these uh, this kind of protects people from from this specific uh, issue but of course like it's not 100% because yeah if one, if one someone is really malicious with this could really try it and until it finds someone voice specifically yeah and do you have any others like ideas of how could we prevent that because yeah that's it's just trial and error people might have enough time to tr do the trial and error yeah um the uh, we we didn't find a way like usually what we uh th those voices that i just showed in the in the talk was from was just like internal we didn't re, re, uh, distributed it uh, the ones that we do have the models are from the public data sets so usually um, those come from those data sets usually audio books and such that are open domi the, the public domain mm. and and due to that we, we have less concern about this but yeah you, you're right like this is something that we we should pay attention to. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I, I have two questions. Uh, one, I don't understand what the flow in the flow-based models means. And the other one okay. is um, uh, like GANs that you can apply a style to a certain image. Is there a way to apply styles to, to voices? Like for instance, to produce a version of you that's angry, that's sad, that's... Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, the first one, flow uh, models are uh, 
basically alternatives to to uh, regular GANs, like generator discriminator. There are uh, VAEs, variational uh, autoencoders, and the flow-based models, which learns, it's like in, 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 um, in summary, what they w want to learn is a, um, a matrix, like a Jacobian, that can be inverted, like w the decoder is, uh, is the inverse of the encoder, basically. So it learns uh, in, this, in such a way. And they call this flow, flow-based uh, flow encoder decoders. And for the second, um, for the second one, sorry, what was? I, uh, it was about styles. Style, yeah, uh, yeah, the style, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, it was basically it. Like you have a gun here, basically the vocoder, and this vocoder is conditioned on the audio, so it learns from. Uh, from the embedding of the speaker. So it gets the latent variable and it gets the uh, reference embedding and it, it is conditioned to that specific voice. So that is why it's a kind of style, yeah, style of voice. Um, I have a question. Thank you for the presentation, Moisir. I think one thing that you mentioned for future work is to remove artifacts. Artifacts are hard in the synthetic nature, right? It's a way to identify that is synthetically created. Could you elaborate a little bit about which artifacts are the hardest to be removed? Uh, what are the challenge and how are you planning to, to actually um, resolve that issue? Yeah, uh, about the, the artifacts, um, uh, the most difficult ones are the, are the background um, undesired noises, like for example, if a motor motorcycle passes during the during the, the the recording, because it's not a constant noise, and it it ends up generating in the in, in this when you synthesize, it ends up generating like strange noises that because it's it tries the model tries to um, convert that into voice, so it it blends everything. So this is the most difficult ones. That is why usually uh, for TTS specifically, uh, it is recommended to be studio recorded and at least 40, uh, sorry, 20, 24 uh, hertz, like for, for the, for, for, for the um, uh, sampling rate. Because it really has, for, for the moment, it really has to be high quality in order to work well. So we, we did try a few uh, filters in order to remove that, but it was not very good because then you, you decrease the quality, you kind of smooth the, the audio, and then you lose the, um, the high pitch parts of the, of the audio. So we just prefer to not do it uh, for, for the moment. But this is something for, I believe, for commercial use, it would be important because um, every person that wants to use this for some reason doesn't have, uh, must, sometimes doesn't have like access to a high quality microphone in studio and such. So it's still an open question. Thank you. Thank you. We have more questions? Okay. One more. You said you were able to find the artifacts. So does it mean that you use the explainable AI to understand your models and find those artifacts? And Sorry, uh, can you? I, I'm not. I can hear you very well. How about now? Yeah, good. Okay. Thanks. You said uh, you were able to identify artifacts. Uh, does that mean that uh, you are using explainable AI in your NLP? to address some of those things and also the privacy concerns? No, uh, we're not using. Uh, we know that there are artifacts because, uh, because knowledge from, from the data, but we, we don't have anything like specifically to deal with it at the moment. 
Yeah. Okay. You could, for example, if you if you are interested, you could work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you. We have more questions. No. Thank you, Monsieur. Thanks very much. Thank you.